Welcome to this video about k-means clustering. In this video we'll learn how k-means clustering works and how to calculate the within cluster sum of squares. We'll also see how we can select an appropriate value of k based on the elbow method. k-means clustering is a method to divide the data into k clusters or groups. In comparison to hierarchical clustering, k-means clustering allows the user to determine the number of clusters that should be generated. For example, if we like to divide these five individuals into two groups, based on the following variables, we could use k-means clustering where we specify that k should be equal to 2. To illustrate how k-means clustering works, we'll use the following data. We could think of this data as two variables, for example the body weight and body height that have been measured on 10 subjects. Note that k-means clustering can be used with more than two variables. However, it is a lot easier to illustrate how the method works if we only use two dimensions. Let's make a scatter plot of the data. Where well, this is data point number 1, and this is data point number 2, and so forth. The first thing that we should do is to determine the value of k, which is the number of clusters the algorithm should identify. Later, we'll try different values of k, but we here begin to set k to 3. Next, we should place the so-called centroids at some initial positions. Since k is equal to 3, we need 3 centroids. Several different methods can be used to randomly select initial positions of these centroids. One way is to use the 4G method, which uses k random data points and use the coordinates of these as initial positions for the centroids. For example, let's say that the following three data points were randomly selected. We therefore move the centroids to the coordinates of these three data points. For example, centroid number 1 has initially the same coordinates as data point number 3. Next, we assign each data point to the closest centroid based on, for example, the Euclidean distance. To calculate the Euclidean distance between data point number 7 and the second centroid, we plug in the x and y coordinates of the data point and the centroid, which results in a distance that is equal to the square root of 5. We calculate the Euclidean distance between each data point and all the centroids. After calculating all these distances, we know that these four data points are closest to centroid number 1, whereas these two data points are closest to centroid number 3, and that these data points are closest to centroid number 2. We have therefore created three initial clusters. Next, we update the positions of the centroids so that they correspond to the mean x and y positions of the data points in the corresponding cluster. For example, the mean of the x-coordinates of the two data points in cluster 3 is 7.5, and the mean of the y-coordinates is 3. We therefore move this centroid to the coordinates that represent the mean position of the two data points in the third cluster. Similarly, we update the positions of the centroids of the first and second clusters. We now repeat the previous steps. We first find the shortest distance between all data points and the centroids. Since data point number 4 now has a shorter distance to the centroid in the third cluster compared to the centroid in the first cluster, it will therefore switch cluster from cluster 1 to cluster 3. Next, we update the positions of the centroids based on their associated data points. Note that this centroid does not change position because the data points in this cluster have not been changed, since data point number 3 is now closer to the centroid of the third cluster, it will also switch cluster. Next, we update the positions of the centroids again, so that they have the following positions. Since all data points are now closest to the centroid of the cluster they belong to, no data point will switch cluster. When this happens, the algorithm will stop. 
So, do the initial positions of the centroids affect the clustering? Unfortunately, yes. For example, what would happen if the centroids are initially placed at the following positions? The algorithm will end up with the following three clusters. So, are these clusters better than the ones we generated earlier? To compare different types of outputs, we need some sort of measure for how well the clustering has performed. One measure is the so-called within cluster sum of squares, which is the sum of the squared Euclidean distance between each data point and the centroid of the corresponding cluster. This measure tells how close the data points are to the centroids. For example, the within cluster sum of squares of the third cluster is calculated like this, where these terms represent the squared Euclidean distance between data point number 10 and the centroid of the third cluster, and this is the distance between data point number 8 and the centroid. The x and y coordinates of the third centroid are here 11.5 and 8.5. The sum of the squared Euclidean distances in cluster 3 is here equal to 1. We calculate the within cluster sum of squares for the two other clusters in a similar way. Then we sum these three to get a total within cluster sum of squares, which is here equal to 76.83. An additional measure that is reported by many software tools is the between cluster sum of squares. This is a measure of how far away the centroids are from the midpoint in the dataset. For example, the squared Euclidean distance between the first centroid and the midpoint is 21.97. Since this centroid is associated to a cluster with two data points, the distance is multiplied by 2. Remember that k-means clustering may result in different outputs depending on the initial location of the centroids. We'll here use the total within cluster sum of squares to determine which of these two outputs that generate the best clusters. We therefore calculate the total within cluster sum of squares of the two different outputs. Since the within cluster sum of squares is smaller in the case to the right, compared to the one to the left, we would select this clustering, which seems reasonable because the data points are generally closer to the centroids and the clusters are well separated. It is therefore important that we try many different initial positions of the centroids and that we then select the clustering that results in the smallest within cluster sum of squares. The same method can also be used when we evaluate different values of k. If we would set k to 1, which means that we only have one cluster, the within cluster sum of squares is equal to 227.3. Since we only have one cluster in this case, the between cluster sum of squares is equal to 0. If you set k to 2, the following two clusters will be generated. With the within cluster sum of squares that has decreased to 84.83 because the data points are now much closer to the centroids. If you set k to 3, the within cluster sum of squares has been reduced to 24.5. And if you set k to 4, the within cluster sum of squares has been reduced to 15.5, and so forth. If you plot the total within cluster sum of squares for different values of k, we'll get the following plot. These points represent the total within cluster sum of squares from our previous examples when we tried four different values of k. Note that there is a steep decrease in the total within cluster sum of squares when k is increased from 1 to 3, but much less when k is increased from 3 to 8. The optimal value of k is the value at the elbow of the curve. The optimal number of clusters for our example data is therefore 3. Finding the optimal value of k this way is called the elbow method. Identifying the elbow of the curve is usually done simply by studying the curve. Note that there are several other methods to find the optimal value of k that are not discussed here.
Finally, we try to understand the strength of the k-means clustering. In our previous example, it was quite easy to identify three clusters of this data set by eye. So, if we can do this by eye, why do we need k-means clustering? Imagine that we now instead would have four variables and would like to find three clusters based on all these four variables. It is now impossible to plot this in a simple way so that we can identify three clusters. However, a computer can easily calculate the Euclidean distance in the four-dimensional space and determine which data points in this space that belong to each of the three clusters. This was the end of this lecture about k-means clustering. Thanks for watching.